Hey folks, this is Jake Davis with a retro review for you today. I'm going to talk about Wayne's World from 1992. Uh, I've been wanting to talk about this movie, or at least been wanting to go back and see this movie again since I saw uh, Bohemian Rhapsody earlier this month, which is just, it's one of my favorite films of the year. Uh, Wayne's World was directed, released in 1992, like I said, directed by Penelope Spheris, uh, starring Mike Myers, Dana Carvey, Rob Lowe, Tia Carrere, Laura Flynn Boyle, Kurt Fuller, Brian Doyle Murray, Colleen Camp, Ed O'Neill, Alice Cooper, Chris Farley, Donna Ditson, <laughs> and Robert Patrick as the Terminator. Yeah, pops up in there. This film is uh, a theatrical adaptation of the Saturday Night Live skit, which was basically about a couple of uh, unofficial stoners and uh, uh, heavy metal guys, headbangers, who just had this cable access, cable access show in their basement in their parents' house. And it was uh, really a great run of stuff they had there on Saturday Night Live, so they figured figured they'd take a shot and make a movie with it. Now, I believe this was only the second attempt by Saturday Night Live to uh, release a film. The previous one, of course, was uh, Blues Brothers in 1980, I believe, which was a big hit, which kind of, kind of makes me think, well, I don't know why they didn't try it again. I know uh, the, uh, Saturday Night Live had a lot of problems in mid and early 80s, but, uh, that's neither here or there right now. Uh, Blues Bro Wayne's World takes the idea of the show and, of course, it expands on it. Uh, the film opens with this fourth wall breaking that only only Wayne and Garth can talk to the camera. And uh, that's some of the funniest stuff in the film. They're back and forth directly to us. There are weird references and bad in-jokes. Uh... <laughs> The film kicks off with, of course, an episode of that, then the fourth wall, and we get the most iconic scene of the movie less than ten f minutes in. And that's the Bohemian Rhapsody headbang. Uh, it's absolutely hysterical. It's still funny today. And the reason it's so funny is that that song is kind of operatic and huge. And, uh, or, you know, it's very, very much an. Uh, 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 composition, orchestra, it's huge fucking song. So, uh, <laughs> there's just me got to throw this heavy metal headbang. I mean, yeah, sure, it's pure rock and roll, but that's how people see it since. It's kind of redefined how people identify and think of that song. It's hard to find anybody my age who, uh, does not think of that scene, this scene, when they see Wayne's, when they hear Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, they end up, hook up with some friends, with some crew members, and they go to a uh, local uh, local uh, rock place club, and it is just unrealistically huge. I mean, been to plenty of bars, clubs, and this. No. Only in movies do you see a club, a bar, like this fucking place. Uh, he meets Cassandra, who was played by Tia Carrera, and absolutely stunning, and she's... Definitely a promising rock star. He falls in love right away. And she digs him too. She thinks he's really funny and knows his show. Uh, around this time, Rob Lowe is in, it, it comes into the story. And he is a douchebag, local, uh, um, ambitious TV producer. And he wants to use this arcade guy to sponsor... Wayne's World, which he wants to buy, to kind of build himself up. He doesn't really give a shit about the arcade or the show. It's about building his own collateral. Uh, of course, he's a douchebag, but Rob Lowe is absolutely hysterical. He brings some uh, some legit legitimacy to this movie, which is really weird because up until this film, he was just a Brat Pack guy, and now he's he's the actor in the film, and he's he's great. He's Probably the best thing about the movie, next to, of course, Dana Carvey is Garth. That's just inspired. Um, to get successful, Benjamin wants to bang Cassandra, and we eventually get your uh, typical 
typical happens in every second act comedy. Or at least enough of them to just say it happens to everyone. It's that big of a cliche. When all of a sudden our main characters aren't friends, aren't talking, there's a fallout. Which usually revolves some kind of uh, montage of people walking around looking sad. I uh, see it in so many goddamn can uh, uh, comedies. It's it's just almost painful. The only time, I, uh, the f first time I could think of it really working in a film, well, it kind of worked in Super Bad, kind of worked in Wedding Crashers, but still at the same time, the first time I saw those movies, like, okay, here we go, this part of the fucking movie. So, uh, this happens, and we do get this little gag where, you know, Wayne is pushing everybody away and becomes such a dick that even his his cameraman, his fourth wall guy, breaks off. He runs up, hey, I'm sorry, dude, I'm sorry. It's, it's a really funny scene. But, uh, eventually he wins back Cassandra by, uh, convincing her Benjamin's a creep, which, uh, hard to, you know, she kind of sees that anyways throughout the movie, finally just has enough of them. Decides to be with Wayne. So, uh, he set her up this kind of big, elaborate Mission Impossible-style gig to this traveling producer guy. He's just always on the road, bouncing all over the place, and he's got this TV in his in his uh, car. So they pirate the signal for his car, so only Wayne's World will be shown on his moving fucking TV car. Limo TV. It's stupid, but it's funny. Uh... Of course, she's playing her live band in the basement on Wayne's World, and he's just so astounded, thinks it's so great, that uh, instantly offers her a contract, and they fall in love, and all this kind of stuff. But that's not the real ending. Well, then we have a second ending, where Benjamin is literally some old man, where they pull his mask off, and it's this whole Scooby-Doo thing. They literally call it a Scooby-Doo ending, and Garth does a Scooby-Doo voice. Uh... But that's not the real ending either. Well, then we get the mega happy ending, which is just really everybody doing their uh, uh, parody of uh, sitcoms and uh, talking to the camera, talking about their lessons. And then it just, you know, the film ends with everybody yelling and partying and the music getting loud when they play the theme song. It is a ridiculous movie. It's a cartoon. It's very comfortable with being a cartoon. Uh, I gotta say... Unlike Blade, it's uh, the bad kind of dated 90s movie, where I really liked the, the dark goth and, uh, you know, druggy techno kind of stuff that Blade reminded me of. Definitely reminded me when I was a teenager. Not the drugs part, but... Um, this reminded me of the stuff I didn't like about it. I don't like about the 90s looking back. You know, this highlighted neon end of hair metal, I mean, 1992, they could get away with it, but by 1994, when the sequel comes out, I mean, we're well into, uh, the grunge era here, I mean, this is the year, that was the year Cobain killed himself, as well as, uh, hell, Smashing Pumpkins were huge by, by that time, I think that was their biggest year, I'm pretty sure that's the year Bull with, uh, Butterfly Wings came out, not 100%, but, uh, what I really liked about this movie was the chemistry of the guys. Uh, Mike Myers and Dana Carvey are terrific, and especially Dana. And uh, Rob Lowe's terrific. Ed O'Neill has like three fucking lines the whole movie, and ev all, they're all hysterical. If he's on the camera, maybe ten seconds of screen time, the whole movie, and it's all comic genius. He's great in it. I mean, he's, as little as he's in it, he's great in it. Kurt Fuller is good in it. He's always a good actor. Never really got any major big roles. Uh, and Brian Doyle Murray is always usually funny. Uh, what I don't like about the movie is the stuff I said. It to, the, the whole setup towards the end. Wayne getting jealous for no reason. Them tanking the show for no real reason. Uh, the just gotta throw it in there kind of generic break it down stuff. Uh... Is it a classic? No, not really. But it holds up better than it should. Uh, I had a lot of fun watching it the other day. And, 
Uh, I would be open, I'm open to watching it again in the future. It's not like, you know, revisiting it this time. It's like, well, I'll never have to see Wayne's World again. I enjoyed Wayne's World quite a bit. I thought it was very, very funny. I laughed a lot. I laughed when they got the two heavy metal people alone in the car and all of a sudden start singing Mickey. That's just a funny little bit. The movie has lots of funny little moments, but it has, it has generic screwball comedy storytelling. There's nothing special about the story of this movie. A lot of funny performances, a terrific supporting cast to make Dana and Mike Myers look good. And uh, it's just kind of baffling looking back now to remember how huge a star Mike Myers became. And a lot of it started right here with this movie. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, I don't 100% uh, consider Wayne's World a classic, but it's definitely got its place. It's got its place in movie history, man. Uh, it's nothing special. But it's something funny. So, uh, if this talks you into wanting to rewatch it, go ahead and rewatch it. Uh, if you never really liked it or was never really a fan or, you know, got sick of uh, Mike Myers for good reason, then I understand that too. Uh, but I enjoy it a lot. Anyways, this is my longest video I've done so far. Sorry about that. Uh, that's what I got to say about Wayne's World 1992. I'm Jake Davis, and I'll catch you on the fly.